It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Kate Clifford Larson um, today. We've we've been together at several events, uh, and I'm so happy to see you here again. Uh, Dr. Larson is a New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestselling author of four critically acclaimed biographies: Bound for the Promised Land, Harriet Tubman, Portrait of, of an American Hero, Rosemary, the Hidden Kennedy Daughter, and the Assassin's Accomplice, Mary Surratt, and the Plot to Kill Abraham Lincoln and her latest, Walk With Me, a biography of Fannie Lou Hamer. Larson earned her doctorate in American history at the University of New Hampshire and has consulted on feature film scripts, including focus features, Harriet and Robert Redford's The Conspirator. The cons yes, The Conspirator, I said that right, wow. Dr. Larson has appeared on local, national and international television, including the BBC, PBS and C-SPAN, cable networks and CBS Sunday Morning. She is frequently interviewed by local, national, and international radio programs and media outlets, so I am in excellent company when I get to welcome you here, uh, Dr. Larson. Take it away. Thank you for having me. Well, this is really exciting to be here and to, um, I feel like it's home, um, and I get to talk about Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, the subject of my latest biography, Walk With Me. Um, so Fannie Lou Hamer uh, was born in Mississippi in October of 1917, and she was the daughter, the 20th child of sharecroppers Jim and Ella Townsend. And um, their lives were pretty much hard scrabble and very difficult, uh, extreme poverty and um, backbreaking labor um, for many months out of the year. Um, as I mentioned, she was the 20th child of Jim and Ella Townsend, but the tragedy is seven of those children born before Hamer was born died, including four children in the four years before Hamer was born in 1917. The survival rate for black children in the Mississippi Delta in particular um, was about one out of every four would die before their fifth birthday. And that's a pretty shocking um, statistics. Um, the lack of access to health care, very poor nutrition, um, the environment was not healthy. There was, you know, they often lived in sharecroppers, sharecroppers' houses. There was poor sanitation, drainage. So children became very sick and, and died. And so it's not surprising that the, the, um, the Townsends had lost um, seven of their children before Hamer was born. So Hamer was raised um, in this family. Um, she, her mother was a very strong personality, a strong presence in Hamer's life. And she cherished little Fannie Lou because one, she was the final child and she survived after those other babies did not survive. And um, she was a very protective mother. And, and in all the things that I read doing research for this book, Hamer spoke the most about her mother. She rarely talked about her father, who was, he was a strict disciplinarian. He was a, a sharecropper, as I mentioned, but he was also a part-time Baptist minister. So he was um, a, a strict Baptist minister father. And, um, and that's the household that, that Hamer grew up in. Um, you can move to the next slide, please. So throughout the 1920s, the family uh, struggled. Some years were better than other years for them. Uh, they moved, actually she was born in Choctaw County and she moved, they moved about 80, 90 miles east when Hamer was three or four years old to um, Sunflower County to a plantation right outside of Ruleville, Mississippi. And um, so they struggled, you know, as I said, some years were better than other years, but the sharecropping system was really designed to keep people tied to the land and barely making a living in an existence. But Hamer was a very smart, um, uh, precocious child. She had a beautiful singing voice, even as a child. So in her church and in the community, they enjoyed listening to her sing. She would have uh, poetry recitals and and other events where she would be uh, the star on stage. She had very limited education. Schools for black children were um, 
very poorly funded. Schools were segregated naturally in Mississippi and, and much of the South. And um, for I think every dollar spent on education, 12 cents went to black schools and the rest went to white schools. And schools for black children were only open um, like three, maybe four months out of the year, whereas the white schools were open the regular school year. So she tried to get as much education as possible. And um, she had to leave school uh, in the sixth grade when she was 12 or 13 years old because her parents needed her to work in the field full time. She started picking cotton when she was six just to bring in the few extra pennies that her pickings could bring to the family. Um, but as I said, by the time she was 12 or 13, she had to go into the fields full time. The other amazing thing about Ruleville and Hamer's singing voice, which some of you who may be familiar with her know about her famous singing. She also grew up in an area that is the birth site of the Delta Blues. So the, those, that blues music came out of those fields, the field haulers, the the shout and the call and response music and the, the specific Delta blues music. And in fact, there were many um, juke houses in the area uh, there during the prohibition, but Mississippi was a dry state for decades anyway. And so there were lots of juke houses. And in fact, um, illegal liquor was uh, quite a business in Mississippi. Her father, even though he was a Baptist minister, brewed his own uh, liquor at home and sold it to boost the family's income. But Hamer heard those, those work songs in the field and the call and response, the spirituals in church. So her musical sensibility and her voice really was honed in this birthplace of the Delta Blues. Next slide, please. So in 1939, um, her father died. And um, since Fannie Lou Hamer was the last one left at home out of all of her siblings, some had moved north or to the east. Some had married and moved to different plantations and were raising their families there. Um, she was left the responsibility of taking care of her, for her mother who became blind during the Great Depression. Um, Fannie Lou Hamer did get married to a young man by the name of Charlie Gray. He was a sharecropper in a neighbor plantation. Um, they didn't seem to live together or spend much time together and they divorced in 1943. And she met and married this man, his name is Perry Pap Hamer, and he was a sharecropper and a mechanic on another neighboring plantation. And um, he also, he had a more privileged position on the plantation because he was um, because he had the skill that he could repair farm equipment, um, he was had better circumstances than the average sharecropper. And um, he also ran a juke house on his property. And um, so he and Hamer met and they married in 1944. And um, the people that I interviewed for this that knew Fannie Lou Hamer and Pap just talked about how Pap was the man. He just was a bigger than life character. And he was, everybody just said he was the man. And he liked his, his bourbon too. Um, you can go to the uh, next slide, please. So during the 1950s, um, the civil rights movement was starting to percolate across the country. Now in Mississippi, you know, the wages for sharecroppers or the, the, the rules and laws dealing with sharecropping were very unfair. And Hamer noticed that the things were unfair um, in her life. And she complained to the other fellow sharecroppers that they should be paid better. She also noticed that some of the bosses in the fields, the white bosses that would come and, and monitor all the labor, um, they would cheat the sharecroppers. They would weigh the cotton at the end of the day and they had these weights called peas and Hamer noticed that the bosses would use altered peas that would change the weight on the cotton so that they wouldn't pay the, the pickers their fair share. So what Hamer would do is when the bosses weren't looking, she'd switch out their altered peas and put in a real one so that she was sure that the sharecroppers were get paid. The other sharecroppers were shocked that she was so bold to risk herself and her life to do that. But there was little she could do because in Mississippi, even though there were half the population was um, black, uh, 
less than 5% during the 1950s was able to vote because Mississippi had horrific voter registration laws that prevented black people from being able to register to vote. So she was frustrated. In the meantime, things started happening in the country. There was Brown v. Board of Education decision that happened that kind of rocked the world. And um, people in the South began to mobilize against these kinds of laws. In 1955, Emmett Till, the young boy from Chicago, 14 years old, was murdered in, and thrown in a river in Mississippi. And that hit the national headlines when um, his mother, Mamie Till, decided to have an open casket uh, funeral in Chicago, and she wanted the world to see what the white supremacists in Mississippi had done to her boy. And then later in 1955, uh, Rosa Parks did not give up her seat on the bus in Montgomery, Alabama, and spark the, the year-long boycott of um, the Montgomery City buses. So these things were happening around her, but not there in Mississippi, and certainly things were not percolating in um, Ruleville, Mississippi. Next slide, please. Um, in 1957, there was the Little Rock um, desegregation of the schools and the National Guard had to be sent in by Eisenhower because the governor of Arkansas would not comply with the ruling of uh, board v v the Board of Education, Brown versus the Board of Education. Um, and then in, you know, in the late 1950s and into 1960, 61, there were young people that were starting to mobilize themselves and they were doing um, lunch counter sit-ins in places like Woolworths in North Carolina and other Southern states. And um, the reaction from white citizens was dramatic and violent. And there was a lot of violence going on in, um, in Southern states in reaction to the, this new movement towards civil rights for African-Americans. Now, Hamer, interestingly, um, you can go to the next slide. Hamer, interestingly, um, said in speeches during the 1960s that she had no idea that she could register to vote or that she was, as a citizen, she could vote, that she had no idea there was all this civil rights activity going on in the country in the 1950s. Um, here's a picture of John Lewis uh, after he'd been brutally beaten in a uh, bus terminal somewhere in the South. Um, the buses where a lot of these young students would, would ride on the buses through the South to test the new uh, federal laws that said all interstate bus terminals um, had to be integrated. And in the South, uh, white citizens fought that dramatically and quite violently. So this is going on around Hamer and she is claiming that she never heard any of this, but actually that is not true. She was very active in civil rights, but very quietly because it was so dangerous in Mississippi to be known to be active in civil rights that you risked your life, you risked your livelihood, um, your housing, everything. You risked a lot if you admitted that you were part of civil rights act activism. Um, so uh, she kept it quiet, but she definitely was a very active um, participant in whatever small things they were trying to do in Mississippi. Next sl slide, please. Now, Hamer and um, Pap, um, adopted two little babies um, during their marriage, a little girl named Dorothy and another girl named Virgie. And Hamer had, um, set, had several miscarriages and a couple of stillbirths that was reported by herself and, and other people. And um, it, was, <clears throat> it bothered her a lot because she wanted to have children with Pap. And after coming from a family, a, such a large family, she wanted children of her own but she had fibroid tumors that were interfering with her fertility. And in 1961, um, the, um, the wife of the plantation owner where she and Pap worked at the W.D. Marlowe Plantation, the wife said to her, why don't you go to Dr. Charles Doro at the hospital here in Ruleville and he will take care of those tumors for you so that you can get pregnant. So she went to the hospital and without her permission or her knowledge, um, Dr. Doro sterilized her instead. He did a complete hysterectomy on her. And um, when she came out of the hospital, he didn't tell her nothing. And she found out from the cook in the Marlowe plantation house um, who overheard Mrs. Marlowe telling a friend of hers that uh, Dr. Doro had sterilized Fannie Lou Hamer. 
and that crushed her. It, it just totally destroyed her. She went into a deep depression. Now, Hamer had a strong faith. She was very, very much um, a very spiritual person and, and rooted in her faith. And she sought solace in her faith. And she tried to understand why he would have done that to her. And as it turns out, he actually had done it to quite a few other black women in Ruleville and forced sterilization of poor women and black women throughout the South and Appalachia was a thing back then. And it was, you could, the doctors did do it against women's permission and apparently they didn't need their permission. So it was just horrifying that um, it wasn't outlawed until I think 1973. So this was something that Hamer uh, suffered and other women in her community did. And as a matter of fact, they called it a Mississippi appendectomy. That's how common it was. And so um, she came out of that, she healed and she was in my, in the book I talk about, she had a rebirth. She reassessed her life and tried to decide you know, where am I going to go now? What am I going to do? I can't deal with these, this oppression and this discrimination anymore. You can turn the page, please. So while um, Hamer was struggling with where she was going to go from there, um, in Atlanta, there was a woman by the name of Ella Baker who worked for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which was the organization that Martin Luther King uh, was part of and led. And she um, was a great organizer and a, a, an incredible human being and civil rights activist. And she had been watching all these young people doing the lunch counter sit-ins and the freedom rides on those buses. And she was so impressed by the courage and the persistence and um, the determination of young students and young people that she decided she would organize them into what they determined would be the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And a young man, a uh, Harvard graduate, uh, teaching at a school in New York City, teaching math, uh, Robert Paris Moses, known as Bob Moses, who died just a few months ago, um, he had been seeing and reading about all the protests as well, and he heard about Ella Baker, and he went to Atlanta and wanted to work with her. So she sent him to Mississippi, and with the directive to get to know the local people, get to know the local leaders, and to bring other young people to Mississippi, SNCC workers, and determine what would be the best for the people there that they wanted not to tell them what they should have or what to do, but to support the goals and aspirations of the people there. So um, in 1962, Bob Moses and a group of SNCC young people went to Ruleville, Mississippi to the William, Mass Mrs. William Mission Baptist, Baptist Church, uh, the church that uh, Hamer went to, and they held a meeting to talk to people about trying to register to vote. You can proceed to the next page, please. So they spoke to the young, there were a couple hundred people that decided to go to this meeting at the chapel and Hamer decided to go and listen to what these young people had to say. She was at that turning point in her life. And um, they got up and spoke to Hamer and the people there. And um, for Hamer, some of the language they used invoked the Bible and um, the words of God, and it really touched her and it mattered to her and they reached her. And at the end of the meeting, they asked for how many people were willing to go to the county courthouse in Indianola and try to register to vote. And she and 17 other people raised their hands out of the 200 people there and said, yes, I'll go. And for Hamer, she later said that that meeting and, and seeing those young people made her realize that there was a new kingdom on earth and it was these young people that were creating this new kingdom. This picture here is of a Mississippi court clerk and registrar who was responsible for administering the voter registration tests. And his name was Theron Lynn. He was in another county, Forest County, and he was notorious for how many people he denied um, the right to vote and saying that they flunked the test. 
Um, he even defied federal court orders to allow um, African Americans to vote. He was one of the last holdouts. He was a really a terrible human being. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. So Hamer uh, went to the courthouse with the 17 other um, residents and she took the test and she flunked it. And um, they were harassed while they were there. There were white supremacists and rowdies, you know, yelling and throwing things at them and spitting at them, tried to drive their bus off the road. The police stopped them and arrested the bus driver because he was driving a bus that was the wrong color yellow you know, all these ridiculous things to try to thwart their efforts to, you know, vote. And um, when she got home to the plantation that night, Mr. Marlowe came to their cabin and said, Fannie Lou, I want you to take that registration back. And she said, no, she had gone to register for herself, not for him. And so he evicted her that night from the plantation. He said to her that Mississippi wasn't ready for that, meaning they weren't ready for black people to vote. So she um, left the, their home and um, SNCC hired her as a field worker because they recognized that she was a leader. She stood up, she sang, people listened to her. They really paid attention to her in the community. And that was SNCC's goal to identify the leaders in the community. And it was Bob Moses that told SNCC leadership that Fannie Lou Hamer was the leader in that community. So they needed to support her in any way that she needed to support so that they could move the needle forward. They could help people register to vote. So um, there were lots of rallies that they were starting to have there in Mississippi and, and voting rights meetings. They were harassed a lot. Um, but Hamer began to notice that um, the, the, the middle class civil rights workers that were already in Mississippi and they were starting to get recognition and be up on stage, um, they didn't really welcome her right away onto the stage. They viewed her as sort of illiterate, um, she wasn't middle class and they just didn't feel that she was the sort of leader they wanted representing them. But she watched and she learned and other people saw that she was a leader. In fact, one of the young people from Mississippi who met her and I interviewed him and he also said in other speeches, and this is what he said about Hamer, that she was the star, the person all of them were wowed by. No one equaled her storytelling. He said she testified, she preached, and she led them in rousing freedom songs and was the center attraction. And whenever she got up to speak, and I listened to a lot of these rallies on tape, and, um, and the audience would hush when she got up on stage. Now, some of the other uh, speakers, mostly men, would be talking and the audience would be talking over them or around or whatever. But when Hamer got up there, the room would silence. And then she would get them going up and, and getting excited and they would start clapping and shouting back and forth. It was a call and response she'd have going on. Uh, another civil rights veteran said to me, she was a powerhouse. She would shine her light. People caught the spirit. You can go to the next slide. So she was really making her mark there in Mississippi. So this is in the fall of, of 1962 into the spring of 1963. And in June 1963, SNCC sent her and a few other SNCC workers to um, South Carolina to take some courses on nonviolent protest techniques, on how to um, take those uh, voter registration tests, find ways to pass the onerous questions and things like that, and to basic citizenship courses. So they were there for a couple of weeks. And on the way back, it's going to and from Mississippi to South Carolina, they were on these interstate buses and the group um, made sure that every terminal they went to, they were able to sit at the lunch counter and use the restrooms that they weren't segregated. They had no problem going to, and, uh, to South Carolina and coming back until they came to Winona, Mississippi, which was just a few miles from Ruleville. And they attempted to um, integrate the restaurant there. You can go to the next, this is the interior of that restaurant, by the way, Staley's Cafe in Mississippi. 
So she was there with um, this young woman, uh, June Johnson, the one on the left who's holding the sign, I wonder is white power dying? She was 14 or 15 years old when she went on this trip with Hamer. And then Anel Ponder here on the right, who was actually a teacher from Atlanta, Georgia that decided to go and work for SNCC in Greenwood, Mississippi. And she was in her early thirties at the time. Um, they were among uh, a group of five others who went to the, the restaurant and they tried to integrate it. The police were called, they were arrested and put in jail at the Winona jail. They were brutally, brutally beaten. And um, Hamer was sexually assaulted. She barely survived. And um, she actually relied on her faith they had no medical care or anything. So she was in a cell with another young worker by the name of Uvester Simpson. And she asked Uvester to sing the, the spiritual walk with me, Jesus, to help her survive the night. She was afraid to fall asleep because she didn't want to die. So that's the title of my book, Walk With Me. You can go to the next slide. In the meantime, SNCC and um, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, all these civil rights workers and lawyers were desperate trying to find them in the jail and to get them released. Um, eventually, after four days, um, they were released from the jail. Um, Andrew Young was a young lawyer at the time and working for SELC. He arrived with other SNCC workers and um, they bailed them out. And it was just a matter of hours. It was June 12th. It was a matter of hours after Medgar Evers, the NAACP um, chief in Mississippi, had been assassinated in his driveway in Jackson, Mississippi. So when they got out of jail, and here's a, the FBI photo of Hamer. FBI uh, saw Hamer right after she was released and they took this picture of her. Um, she discovered that he had been murdered. And so having barely survived that beating herself and the assassination of Medgar Evers was like another turning point for Hamer that um, she actually said um, later, she said that she would not be intimidated if them crackers in Winona, she said, thought they'd discourage me from fighting, I guess they found out different. I'm going to stay in Mississippi and if they shoot me down, I'll be buried here. It made her more committed and more resolved in her determination to make a change in Mississippi and to be able to vote. But it's her faith that carried her through. You can go to the next slide. Um, so that was June of 1963. In August of 1963 was the, the famous March on Washington where Martin Luther King gave his I Dream, of, uh, uh, I Dream speech. And um, she did, Hamer did not go to this, but it was quite an event. But that the response in the South was, for instance, the bombing of the, um, the church in Birmingham, Alabama, where the four young girls were murdered. And so the violence was just stepping up and becoming more and more severe. And the police response was more violent against civil rights workers as well. You can go to the next slide. Hamer and the rest of them knew that voting rights was the only way to make a change. Um, so Hamer, along with two other women, Victoria Gray and Annie Devine helped found the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Um, as an alternative to the white Democratic Party, which had no black members, you know, there might have been a couple, but they, it was all white Mississippi Democratic Party. And um, people had been saying to the federal government, well, black people don't really want to vote. So why is everybody all excited about this? So Hamer and the others wanted to prove them wrong. And by having their own political party and they had mock elections so they could prove to the world that African-Americans wanted to vote. And so here's an example of a, a mock election and they had a ballot box. And um, so 80,000 people voted um, uh, the following summer so that they could prove to President Johnson and others that yes, they wanted to vote. You can go to the next um, slide, please. And in the summer of 1964, SNCC decided to have a freedom summer and they brought 850 young people and volunteers from around the country to come to Mississippi to help build um, uh, 
community centers. They conducted uh, freedom schools where they held classes for children and adults, and they tried to do voter registration, try to encourage people to go and try to take those tests and um, register to vote. And it was a huge success in some ways, but in other ways, the reaction from the white supremacists was violent and swift. And in fact, in the first couple of weeks of the uh, Freedom Summer, three young SNCC workers, um, Mickey Schwerner, Jim Cheney, and Andrew Goodnam, Goodman were murdered. Uh, James Cheney, Jim Cheney was a local Mississippi young man, and the other two were um, uh, from New York City. But they were murdered and um, by Klan members, and their bodies were missing for about six weeks. So this is the what's going on in the summertime. These SNCC workers were hassled all the time. They were arrested constantly. They were people shot at them and tried to run them off roads. And they, um, the people, the local people that hosted them in their homes, they lost their jobs. They had, you know, gunshots blown into their homes too. It was a very, very violent summer. But the courage of those young people so impressed Hamer. She just could not believe these young people were willing to do this. And she later said that she felt that there was more Christianity in those young children than in any church she had ever been in her whole life. You can go to the next slide, please. Um, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, the civil rights workers and Hamer in Mississippi decided they wanted to challenge the seating of the Mississippi regular all white Mississippi Democratic Party. Um, they wanted to prevent them from being seated at the Democratic National Convention in August in Atlantic City, where they would nominate uh, President Johnson to be on the ticket for the November presidential election. And because the all-white party did not represent half of Mississippi, they were going to challenge them. And the Democratic National Committee agreed that they could challenge the seating of the all-white Mississippi party. You can go to the next um, slide. So they arrive in Atlantic City and they had to um, give testimony in front of the Credentials Committee of the, Dash, the Democratic National Committee. And Martin Luther King spoke and several other civil rights activists, mostly from Mississippi, spoke. And then Fannie Lou Hamer got up and spoke. And the testimony was riveting and it rocked the world. Um, she was so powerful, she did not have notes like Martin Luther King read his speech it had been written for him by somebody else. When she got up there and spoke, she spoke from her heart and from memory. And um, the New York Times wrote that she kept the audience spellbound and witnesses that were there said people were crying. White people, black people in that room, that packed room were crying. The Mississippi delegates, the white delegates were shaking their heads in disgust, but everybody else was riveted by what Hamer was telling them what was going on in Mississippi. President Johnson was also watching from the White House. There was live coverage, NBC News covered every minute of the convention. And when he saw her speaking, he knew that was trouble because she was so powerful. So he called an impromptu press conference to interrupt her speech. He got up to a podium and he said something ridiculous like, I just wanna remind everybody that nine months ago and so many days ago, President John F. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas. And then after you know a three minute little speech, he ended it and walked away from the podium. But And so when the television cameras got back to the convention room, uh, Hamer had, was finishing up her speech and leaving the stage. So it, he, President Johnson thought he had dodged a bullet because he didn't wanna deal with the civil rights issue right then and there. He needed the votes of the Mississippi and other Southern Democratic delegates so that he would win the nomination. Some of the delegates were threatening to vote for George Wallace instead. So he didn't want anything to rock the convention. Um, unfortunately for him, that night NBC rebroadcast her speech so the whole country saw her talk and they were moved. Thousands of telegrams flooded Atlantic City, Congress, the White House. Um, but Lyndon B. Johnson negotiated behind um, Hamer's back. You can go to the next slide. Uh, he negotiated with Martin Luther King and other powerful civil rights activists. And he agreed that um, 
that the Mississippi all white delegation would be seated and the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, Hamer's party would receive two non-voting seats. They could sit there and watch the proceedings. Well, that wasn't good enough for Hamer. She was furious while other people she believed in and counted on betrayed her and she was completely devastated. Here's a scene of one of the protests outside in Atlantic City. There were protests every single day. Hamer is there with Mickey Schwerner's parents um, and trying to, to drum up support to try to stop the all white Mississippi delegation from accepting their, or taking their seats during the convention. As it turns out, the Mississippi delegation was so ticked off that the uh, Hamer's party got two non-voting seats. They refused to go to the convention and they walked out and they ended up um, apparently all voting for Barry Goldwater who was against civil rights. And it was the beginning of, well, part of the movement of the South changing from Democrat to uh, Republican at the time. You move to the next um, slide. <clears throat> and here's just a, a, a disappointed uh, Hamer. She still tried to get seated on the floor, tried to vote, and eventually they had to um, usher them from the, the convention because they were not going to get seated. You can go to the next slide. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> the election that I told you about that the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party held, they voted for their own candidates, including Fannie Lou Hamer. <clears throat> so that fall and that winter, Hamer and the other uh, Mississippians, Black Mississippians, who had been elected on the mock, during the mock elections, went to Congress and demanded that the all-white Mississippi uh, congressmen that had been elected not be seated because the election wasn't fair because black people couldn't vote. So it was tabled until the following fall in 1965 and Hamer, Annie Devine and um, Victoria Gray were invited back to Congress to hear debate on their challenge. They lost the challenge, but um, they were the first African-American women to ever sit on the floor of the house. You can go to the next slide. <coughs> He worked with King a little bit, not very much. They were very different people with different styles. He didn't really relate to her. She was grassroots and he was highly educated and on a national stage. So while they appeared once in a while, this is the March Against Fear through Mississippi, um, they were not close at all. <coughs> you can go to the next slide, please. But all her work and all her campaigning, she never stopped fighting and Mississippi changed. And especially with, in 1965, President Johnson promised that he would pass a voting rights legislation, which he did, the new voting rights laws in uh, 1965. And um, that changed the landscape in Mississippi, even though some of those court registrars wouldn't still wouldn't allow black people to vote eventually by the end of 66 and into 67. Um, th thousands and thousands and thousands of African Americans registered to vote and they started to change the landscape of not only Mississippi but the South. At the 1968 Democratic Convention in, in Chicago, um, the Mississippi All-White Democratic Party was refused their seats. They weren't allowed to sit and vote at the convention and Hamer's party, which was renamed the Loyalist Democratic Party, was seated and Hamer had a vote. And when she got up to give a speech, she received a standing ovation. You can go to the next slide. Um, she campaigned um, against the Vietnam War. She felt that we had lots of problems here in America and why should um, particularly young black men who were discriminated against here go and fight for freedom for other people if they couldn't have freedom here. She also um, campaigned for universal um, uh, childhood education, preschool, universal preschool, uh, universal health care, um, equity in school systems, um, all sorts of things that in some ways we're still fighting for some of the things that she fought for. And um, she was very much in demand around the country. She went to a lot of college campuses and other big rallies. Here's one in Lafayette Square outside of the White House um, in 1969. And she, 
she was an amazing, amazing speaker and powerhouse. Uh, she just had an incredible effect on people. And also she helped raise a lot of money for the civil rights movement. You can go to the next slide. Um, but she was a grassroots person and she really cared about her community and she brought a lot of changes to the community. She um, helped ensure that uh, federal housing dollars came to the community to help um, with housing for people who were living in shacks with no plumbing and, and just horrific conditions. She also, um, through the help of Dorothy Height and the um, uh, the national the national uh colored women's clubs um that they raise money for a pig farm so that local people in uh, mississippi particularly in ruralville and other rural communities could have access to meat so they would get a pig at the beginning of the season and then after the pig had babies they'd return a pig and they could keep all the others for meat for themselves for the winter um, she also started a farm co-op and eventually acquired uh, quite a few acres of land so that local people could grow their own crops and feed themselves um, throughout the winter time. You can go to the next slide. She also helped found um, the National Women's Political Caucus with uh, Shirley Chisholm and Bella Abzug and Gloria Steinem and others. And she, um, she was a very conservative feminist, but she was also a very powerful feminist. She was against, um, she was uh, anti-choice and, um, and even later in her life, she was uh, anti-birth control, which was very puzzling considering she had actually been very pro-choice and birth control before her own steril uh, forced sterilization. Um, and she and younger feminists clashed frequently um, during that movement period in the uh, late 60s and early 70s. You can go to the next slide. Um, so as a result of her injuries from the beating in 1963, she suffered from uh, kidney ailments and other issues as a result of that beating. She also had hypertension, um, diabetes, and other health issues that really affected her throughout the rest of the 1960s. And her health began to dramatically decline in the early 1970s. She eventually developed um, breast cancer and um, she struggled to maintain her activism, but she was deeply weakened by her health conditions. And then once she had a mastectomy and chemotherapy, it was very difficult to keep up her schedule. She was so committed to trying to uh, fight for food equity and, and health equity and anti-poverty programs and anti-war programs. And so she was often physically exhausted. She was hospitalized uh, several times for exhaustion during the early uh, 1970s as well. You can go to the next um, slide. So she died on March 14th, 1977, complications of breast cancer. Um, she died deeply in debt from healthcare costs and, and other things, but um, thousands of people uh, appeared for her funeral there in Ruleville. And one of the people that worked with her during that Freedom Summer and became very close to her was an older man. He was a journalist by the name of Tracy Sugarman. And um, he wrote about uh, Hamer later. He said, quote, all my memories of Fannie Lou Hamer are ones filled with frenetic movement and gigantic energy. He said that kinetic quality emanated from her like waves setting in motion all who were in her path. And I thought that beautifully describes Fannie Lou Hamer. Hamer was a movement herself and she really changed the world for voting rights and for people in her community and around the country. And um, it's amazing that a, a woman like Fannie Lou Hamer, the 20th child of dirt poor sharecroppers could rise up and really take on the world and make a huge difference. Thank you very much. So we can probably close that and take questions if there are questions. Absolutely, thank you so much. Thank it was you. wonderful. What a what an inspiring and tragic story. I know it is tragic in some ways. Yes. Yeah, and you know to be carrying the physical um, evidence of that, not only her her difficult 
upbringing, but her, you know, that violent attack. Yeah. Sure. That shortened her life as well. Right. Right. Um, we have a question from the audience. Did present voter suppression measures inspire you to research and write this biography? So that's an interesting question. Um, perhaps in the back of my mind, but um, I learned about Fannie Lou Hamer back in the 1990s when I was in graduate school. And I always put her sort of like in the back of my mind. I did so much work on um, Harriet Tubman, who Hamer and Tubman are so incredibly similar. It is just remarkable in my mind. But Hamer was always sitting there with me, but I went on to write other biographies. But by when after the Rosemary Kennedy book came out in 2015, Hamer was like really knocking hard, like, hello, hello, it's time. So I decided to start researching her. I did not expect that between 2015 and I started slowly researching her and today that voter suppression would be what it is right now. I had I could not have predicted that it would be like that. So her legacy is so important and how how incredibly similar her life passion was, what it was all about, you know, ending voter suppression and it's happening all over again. And that 1965 Voting Rights Act, how important that was, it changed everything and how portions of it were overturned in 2013 in the Shelby v. Holder Supreme Court case. And that's why we need to pass that voting rights legislation uh, now. Well, uh, the other question that we that just came in is uh, sort of a similar vein. What do you think she would say? And I would add, what would she do about the voter suppression efforts going on today? I think she would say, uh, you know, here we go again. Uh, and she would say, you got to fight, fight, fight. I mean, that's what she did at great cost to herself and her health. Um, but she would she would fight, continue to fight. And and the reality is there are people like Fannie Lou Hamer in communities around the country. We may not know them now or recognize them or they're emerging and some we do know, you know, they're the Stacey Abrams of the world. And so we need to recognize them and we need to support them because not all of us are gonna be a Fannie Lou Hamer, but we can be the people behind those great leaders who do extraordinary things, who have that voice on and a platform to make people make a difference. Absolutely, I, I have a question. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you mentioned that uh, Fannie Lou Hamer's father was a minister. How did you see her family's religion or her personal religious convictions um, in her work? Uh, and also, do you think that had something to do with her speaking, her ability to speak in public? Was that a yeah. Inherited trait, is that something she honed in church? Yeah, I think um, part of it is uh, she was raised in that kind of household and that environment. Like I said, she's in the fields, that call and response back and forth, the loud voice. Um, but faith was central to Fannie Lou Hamer. It was at her core. Um, and it, it shaped her life. It, it helped her navigate a very frightening world in Mississippi. It comforted her, she found solace in it, it fortified her. And she knew that those white supremacists who went to the white Christian church down the street were not Christians because of their hate. And she believed that um, she could not hate people even though she wanted to, but that destroys um, your spirit and who you are. So she fought always to keep her her faith in the forefront. And she talked about it when she was speaking on stage, she would always bring up her faith. She'd always recite um, Bible passages to the audiences, even totally agnostic audiences and college students, you know, did they care about Bible passages? No, but they listened to her and they, they absorbed what she said because she was so powerful and she meant it. She felt it from her heart. All right, we have one more um, question. Actually, we have two more questions. They're rolling in now. Okay, so Fanny failed the test that they put before her when she went to register to vote. But when she came home with a registration, it caused her to be evicted. How did Fanny and other civil rights workers get around these unfair tests and finally get their voter registrations? 
So sometimes they did pass them, um, you know, there, so Fanny was literate. So she, she could pass the test depending on whether the, the clerk was going to approve her answers. And each county had their own kind of questions. Some of them were ridiculous, like how many beans are in this jar? Uh, the one that Fanny Lou Hamer had to take, she had to interpret a passage of the Mississippi Constitution that was nonsensical. It just was like, you know, you needed to be a constitutional law, legal mind to, to do that. So she learned how to take the test and she did pass it. Um, but in Mississippi also, uh, the clerk of courts um, uh, passed the voting tests of white people who were illiterate. Fannie Lou Hamer talks about getting stopped for a ticket for speeding or something, and she had to fill out the ticket because the policeman was illiterate. So, you know, that happened all the time. People who white could get, you know, voter registrations, but not black people, even if they were literate. It was it was crazy. Uh -oh. uh, so this is a, a question about her relationship with Dr. King. Uh, it says, interesting that you say she and Dr. King weren't close, so they fought the same battle. Any evidence that he felt threatened by her? So uh, people ask me that. I don't know if he felt threatened by her. He certainly was very powerful. Um, you, you've got to remember it was the 1960s too. And while some women in the movement felt very equal to their male counterparts, it was mostly those young people who felt, you know, the young college students and volunteers, they were equal men and women. But in older generations, it was still men did everything and women did the, the grunt work behind the scenes. They weren't on the stages. And so um, I, I think, well, there are some very unattractive things that uh, I didn't have any quotes from King who said bad things about Hamer, but some of the men around him, you know, Ralph Abernathy and, and a lot of those guys, they said horrific things about Hamer and to her face. They said that they were disgusted by her clothes and her speech pattern because she had a thick Mississippi you know, accent, um, that she didn't speak perfect English and that, you know, she should go home now and let the big boys take care of everything. So she experienced tremendous discrimination. King, um, while he was very supportive of her, he just didn't relate. He was a very um, well-educated and by then very powerful man. And he just really didn't know how to relate to a Mississippi sharecropper. That's the truth. Yeah. That's very interesting. It's a, uh, you know, the way that class and gender and race mm -hmm. really come yeah. together in her story. Yeah. It's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Uh, we have time for a couple more questions. Um, we have one is a question and one is a comment. Uh, her speech that was replayed that night on NBC, is that easy to find? Yes, you can go on YouTube and find it. <laughs> I, think we, I think we will all do that. Yeah, so I will caution though, um, it used to be readily available everywhere. And then a lot of those NBC archives were purchased by, I don't know, somebody like Bettman archive or something like that. So now you can't get the whole thing visually, but you can find it. Um, you can hear the audio of it somewhere online. You'll hear the whole speech. And it is really powerful, really powerful. And there were other speeches that she gave that you can hear like at the Smithsonian, they have a collection of, of uh, rally um, recordings and you can hear her sing, you can hear her give speeches. Wow. And also um, the Newport uh, Blues Festival in the like 64, 65, 66, she was invited to sing on stage with like Peter, Paul and Mary and Odetta oh, right. and, and um, uh, Joan Baez and all those people. So you can go and see clips of her singing on stage with all those amazing people. She met um, Bob Dylan and she sang with Pete Seeger. So you can hear that stuff online too. I encourage you, cause that's the fun stuff. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, we are, we at the Museum of Old Newbury are always trying to deepen folks' experience of um, our events. So we will pull some of those links together and we will post them on our Facebook page tomorrow. How's that, everybody? Or you can email us and we'll, uh, we'll send them to you. We'll see what we can find. That'll be fun. Now I'm, I'm looking forward to doing that tomorrow. Okay, we've got a, a long question here. Both Fannie Lou Hamer and Rosa Parks became radicalized and became effective, skilled organizers in significantly in response to sexual violence. Uh, RP responding to sexual violence by Birmingham bus drivers. Are there ways in which Me Too awareness might catch on and catch up 
to these women's incredible, powerful activism in that way? Um, I'm not sure how to answer that, except that um, when I wrote about Hamer's assault in my book, I was deeply informed by the Me Too movement, that I felt that she, she could never stand on the stage and say, I was sexually assaulted. It just, in her world, she couldn't do that. But I could, I could do it today. So that's why uh, Me Too affected my telling of Hamer's story. I hope that I, I, was, uh, I was right in feeling that I could give her the voice that she could not have back in the 1960s. Wow, it's incredible. Now I have one last question. This Dr. Duro, who operated on her without oh. her consent, please tell me that it's not D-O-R-A-U. <laughs> no, 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 it's D-O-R-R-O-U-G-H. And oh, his, father, <laughs> his father was the mayor of Ruleville too. And, oh, that's um, awful. Yeah, and, and actually SNCC um, tried, to, uh, tried to have him... Um, to not try to sue him, but called like before the medical board. And they tried to get testimony from the women that he had sterilized, but they all got afraid because they didn't want repercussions on them. They didn't want to lose their jobs or be shot at or things like that. So they could never file charges against Darrow for, for what he did. Well, it's a horrific act of violence against mm -hmm. women, against people. Right. Um, oh. Okay, so the, we'll end with this. We've got one last question. What might Hamer suggest we do in the context of Kirsten Cinema's announcement today? So I think that Hamer would say fight, fight, fight. And she also, uh, Hamer was very blunt. She would have some very choice words for Kirsten Cinema. Can yeah. you just recap what her announcement was today just for those she said she will it. not vote to um, change the filibuster laws to include voting rights um, legislation. So that kind of kills the, the voting rights legislation, which is remarkable to me because that, you know, it's, yeah, anyway, I don't, I don't need to get into that right okay. now. Okay, well, yeah. wow, that's, uh, it's so relevant. Your book is so relevant. We've got lots of folks on here saying, thank you, excellent, we're getting the book. Can't wait. And of course, because my colleagues at the Museum of Old Newbury are so on it, uh, there's already a link to the audio in the chat, but we'll make sure that that shows up on Facebook and we'll, uh, we'll include some information in the next newsletter. So uh, with that, I wanna just thank you again so much. Thank you for continuing to take my calls and answering my emails. I love having you. Uh, I, always, I, I always wanna slot you into every, every program I'm doing, every organization that I'm thank part of. Thank you, Bethany. So, I Thank really you. appreciate that. I appreciate all of your uh, rigorous research and hard work. Thank um, you. I also just want to invite everybody to come and watch PowerPoint uh, Fluster Me next Tuesday. <laughs> I am uh, I'm doing a presentation on Victorian photography, spirit and postmortem photography, which is a completely different topic, um, but with the uh, New Report Public Library. And uh, you can see that link on our website and on our Facebook page. Uh, so you can come see me there and register for that event. It's at 7 p.m. next Tuesday. And with that, Dr. Larson, I will bid you and our audience a very uh, good evening. And thank you so much again for being here. From the good night, everybody. Day. Fight, fight, fight. Bye, everyone. Fight, fight, fight. Absolutely. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.